الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم إنا نسألك علما نافعا ورزقا طيبا وعملا متقبلا uh, This will be our last session for the series on uh, intention and the importance of sincerity from the chapter the opening chapter of Riyadh al-Salihin by Al-Imam al-Nawawi. Uh, so in the previous uh, session, we covered uh, hadiths number, uh, was it? Seven to nine. So uh, we'll just do, I'll just read the hadith that we covered last time uh, because we, we are going to be running short in time. So I'll just read the hadith instead of going uh, full review. And then we'll proceed to the hadith of today. So we covered uh, the hadith number seven last time. Inna Allah ta'ala la yandru ila surikum wa amwalikum. Uh, some, some narrations mention uh, wa, wa Some narrations mention your wealth. Allah does not look at your bodies or your forms and your wealth. Or some hadith mention Allah does not look at your uh, forms and your bodies. So there are different wordings of the hadith. Uh, but he looks at your forms and your deeds. All right, hadith number eight. فقال الرجل يقاتل حمية ويقاتل شجاعة ويقاتل رياء فأي ذلك في سبيل الله قال من قاتل لتكون كلمة الله هي العليا فهو في سبيل الله أبو موسى الأشعري رضي الله عنه reported that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم was asked about who fights in the battlefield out of valor or out of zeal or out of hypocrisy which of them which of this is considered as fighting in the cause of Allah and he said he who fights in order that the word of Allah remains the supreme is considered as fighting in the cause of Allah Alright, hadith number nine. So this is the hadith we ended on last time, which is that if two Muslims confront each other uh, with the sword or any other weapon, it doesn't have to be the sword. Of course, the sword was the prevalent uh, way of fighting back then, but it could be in today's age the gun. Right, or any other weapon, then both of them are in the hellfire. And this is, uh, follows a prohibition, a general prohibition, which is that a Muslim is not allowed to raise the weapon against another Muslim. And even in the hadith, it mentions that uh, there's a prohibition, prohibition of even pointing a weapon, even if you're joking. Even if you're joking and you point a weapon at a believer, this is prohibited and this is uh, not allowed. And a believer is never to kill another believer except by mistake. Uh, we mentioned that there are exceptions to this. Uh, so it's not that every time a Muslim raise, uh, raises the sword or weapon against uh, his brother that it is prohibited. There are some situations where it is allowed. Uh, and that is fighting rebels. Right? Uh, if there is a, a ruling authority and then you have some rebels who are coming and making trouble in the in Islamic State. And maybe they want to rebel. In that case, then it is allowed for the ruler to use the, the sword or any other way of, um, of subduing them. After, of course, you know, trying diplomatic ways first. You, you, know, you try to be diplomatic first, but it is allowed. And this is mentioned in the Quran. Allah says, first try to make reconciliation if two groups of Muslims are fighting. But if one of them is uh, transgressing against the other, Allah says, then fight the transgressing party until they come back to the rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so there are situations also of defending oneself if another Muslim comes and attacks you and you're defending yourself then you can raise a weapon against that Muslim even if you kill that Muslim it is allowed if it comes to that and in fact this would be considered you'd be, uh, if, if you're killed in this manner you're be considered a shaheed it comes in hadith man qutila duna malihi then he's a shaheed. Whoever is, is killed defending his wealth, his property, or defending himself, then you, this is a type of shahada that uh, a person will earn uh, that status in the hereafter for, even if that person is a Muslim. All right? Even if that per person is a Muslim. So there are exceptions, but the general rule is that a Muslim should not raise a weapon against the other Muslim. All right, and we gave scenarios right, um, of two people fighting each other. Both of them are in hellfire. When? If they're both kuffar, then one kafir kills the other kafir, then they're both in hellfire. 
Or as in this hadith, if there are two Muslims, then they're fighting. Then Rasulullah says both of them, Al-Qatil wal maktulu fil nar Scenario number two, the killer is in paradise and the killed is in hellfire, which is? So the, the person who killed is a, a believer and this is in the battlefield and he kills a disbeliever in the battlefield. Then the disbeliever who dies as a disbeliever, he goes to hellfire and the believer, uh, he goes to paradise. Scenario number three, the killer is in hellfire and the killed is in paradise. So this, yeah, so this would be the opposite. A kafir kills a Muslim. Right. Huh? Yeah. Well, this, no, that's the second, that's the one, last one coming up. But this one is the killers in hellfire. The kafir kills a, a believer, all right, and he dies on kufr, then he goes to hellfire. And the believer, is die, he dies as, sh as a shaheed, he dies as a martyr. The last scenario, both in paradise. This is the one where uh, it's a bit, um, requires some thinking. But we mentioned this last week, that if the, yeah, if a kafir kills a believer, and then that kafir later on becomes a Muslim. So now both of them are in, uh, in paradise. Because the believer who was killed, he dies as a shaheed, as a, as a martyr. And the kafir, he became a Muslim, so everything else before Islam is forgiven. And there's a hadith on this that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala laughs at uh, one, of, uh, one of two situations, and this is one of them, where uh, a person, a kafir, killed a disbeliever, and then a believer, and then he later on becomes a Muslim, and he dies upon Iman, then he goes into paradise. Both of them are in paradise. All right, uh, this hadith also shows us the five stages of action. All right, we mentioned these. So for any, um, any action, it goes through five, five stages. The first is the passing thought. All right, so whether it's a good deed or evil deed, the thought comes to your head, let me do this, let me do that. All right, it's a passing thought, and it can either settle in, in your mind, or it can go after that. The second is inner dialogue, where now you start to think about it and talk, uh, you, you start to converse in your mind about doing this action. The third is now having an intent to do this action. The fourth is now having a firm resolve. Right? So this would be, you made that intent, and now let's say if somebody wants to carry out a murder, they go and buy the, the weapon. This would be number four. All right? They have made a firm intent, and they've, they've, done, they've done what is required to carry, carry out the action, like buying the, the, the murder weapon or so on. And then number five is completing the action. All right, what are we held accountable for? We are held accountable for four and five. If it gets to four and five, then now you're accountable. So you made that firm resolve to do the action and you possibly started the preparation for that action. You will be held re responsible if that is a sin. Or if it is a good deed, then you will be rewarded for it. And of course, if you complete the action, then it's a, if it's a good action, you're rewarded. If it's a evil action, you are sinful. All right, so in this hadith, it is based on what that the maqtul is held responsible. All right, so Rasulullah said that the killer and the killed is both in the hellfire. Why is the killed person held in hellfire? Going, going to hellfire because he did number four. All right, he went to the level of number four, which is that he had that firm resolve to kill his fellow believer and his fellow brother. So he is punished based on that resolve, even though he did not do the actual action, but because he was trying to, and he had that intention, firm intention, and he raised the sword as well. The, on, the, only, the only thing is that he didn't strike first. So he was, uh, he was killed, but he had that intention and that firm resolve to also kill his brother, and so he is also in the fire, as Rasulullah said. All right, so we're not accountable for the first three, um, but we are accountable for the last two. And we see this also, that you can also re receive uh, reward and it's as if you carried out an action if you do number four, step number four, even if you don't get to step number five. And we see this in the, in the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, right? When he was ordered to sacrifice his son. Did he actually sacrifice the son? No, right? But he went to step number four. فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَا وَتَلَّهُ لِلْجَبِينَ Allah says in the Quran, when they both submitted, both Ibrahim and Ismail, they both submitted, and he put his, uh, the head uh, on, on the ground. And then Allah called out, You have fulfilled the vision. Even though he didn't actually slaughter, but he did enough. He went to step number four. And that is enough for him to be considered to have fulfilled the sacrifice. And so Allah says that you fulfilled the vision. And so it was considered as though he did the action because he went to step number four. Alright, that was hadith number uh, nine. We move on to hadith number ten. 
صلاة الرجل في جماعة تزيد على صلاته في سوقه وبيته بضعا وعشرين درجة وذلك أن أحدهم إذا توضأ فأحسن الوضوء ثم أتى المسجد لا يريد إلا الصلاة لا ينهزه إلا الصلاة لم يخطو خطوة إلا رفع له بها درجة وحط عنه بها خطيئة حتى يدخل المسجد فإذا دخل المسجد كان في, في الصلاة ما كانت الصلاة هي تحبسه والملائكة يصلون على أحدكم ما دام في مجلسه الذي صلى فيه ما لم يحدث فيه Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu narrates that Rasulullah said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said the reward for salah performed by a person in congregation is more than 20 times greater than that of salah performed in one house or one shop. When one performs wudu perfectly and then proceeds to the mosque with the sole intention of performing salah, then for every step he takes towards the mosque he is upgraded one degree in reward and one of his sins is eliminated until he enters the mosque. And when he enters the mosque, he is considered as performing salah as long as it is the salah which prevents him from leaving. And the angels keep on supplicating Allah, uh, Allah for him as long as he remains in his place of prayer. They say, O oh Allah, have mercy on him. O oh Allah, forgive his sins. O oh Allah, accept his repentance. This will carry on as long as he does not pass wind. Alright, so this hadith is, uh, is uh, uh, emphasizing the importance of uh, the salah in jama'ah. And there's a long dispute amongst the scholars about the status of Salat al-Jama'ah. What, what, what is the ruling on praying in the Jama'ah? And there's some scholars who have raised it all the way up to wajib. And some scholars say it is fard kifaya, and others say it is sunnah, emphasize sunnah. There's three main opinions, but it does go all the way up to some scholars saying that it is uh, a wajib. Uh, not necessarily in the masjid, but just to pray in Jama'ah. Uh, it is considered to be, and this is a position, official position of the Hanbali Madhab, is that correct? Right, of the Hanbali Madhab, that they say Salah is not valid unless you pray in Jama'ah. Right, so this is uh, a, 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 a position that has been taken by some of the scholars, although the majority of scholars say that it is not uh, wajib, but nonetheless, it is highly recommended. Yeah, yeah in Jama'ah, not in the Masjid necessarily, but just in Jama'ah. Right, and obviously in the Masjid it will be even higher level. Uh, now the Jama'ah according to the Fuqaha is how many people? So according to the language, Arabic language, jama'ah is three or more, right? In Arabic language, three or more before you can have a jama'ah. According to the fuqaha is how much? Two, right? So two would form a jama'ah according to the scholars of fiqh. According to the scholars of Arabic language, three, three or more. But for a jama'ah to be established in, according to the fuqaha, you have, you have at least two people. Two people perform the salah, then this is considered to be the jama'ah. All right, uh, and... Uh, so we see in the hadith, right, that uh, if you perform the salah in jama'ah, it's 20 times greater. Some uh, narrations mention 27 times, 25 times. But this increase in reward is conditional. Right? If you look at the hadith, it's conditional. When you perform wudu perfectly, this is when you are eligible to get that 20 plus uh, multiplication. All right? Uh, and then you walk to the masjid, and then you remain in the masjid uh, until the salah commences. When a person does those conditions, then they are eligible for that increased reward. Right? So it's not just necessarily coming to the masjid. Of course, you, you can expect a multiplication reward, but to get that full uh, 20 times plus more, then you need to do what is mentioned in this hadith, which is when one performs wudu perfectly. And we'll mention, we'll get to that, what does it mean by isbag uh, wudu. Perform the wudu perfectly, then proceeds to the, to the masjid with the sole intention of performing the salah. Right, that means that if a person is coming to the salah for some other reason, then they're not eligible for that full reward. Right? So this is a person coming, I'm only coming to, for the salah. person is coming, I want to meet this person as well. You get the reward, right? As we mentioned in the previous classes, you can, the, the niyyah can be split in that way, but you can't expect the full reward. Right? The full reward, 20 times more, that, that's only going to be for the people who fulfill the conditions of this hadith, which is you perform wudu perfectly, you come to the masjid only for the salah, only for the sole intention of the salah. Then, then you get that full reward, and then every step you take to the masjid is uh, upgrade in degree, and sins are eliminated. And as long as you're waiting for the salah, you're considered to be in salah. Right? You come to the masjid, it's five, ten minutes before salah. As long as you're, you're simply waiting for the salah to commence, you're considered to be as though you are performing the salah. Just as long as you're waiting, and the salah is the only thing that's keeping you in the masjid from leaving. 
and the angels also are supplicating for this person as well. All right, so these these are levels. Now we have le yeah. You have, a, you have a question? Okay, okay. I thought, I thought you saw your hand up. All right, we have levels of reward in praying. All right, lowest level. So all by yourself. All right, this is the lowest level. All right, what is above that? What is above that? Yeah. Together. All right, salat and jama'ah outside of the masjid. All right, so you pray in jama'ah outside of the masjid. This is level number two. Level number three. In the masjid, right? So in the masjid, outside the masjid, they're not the same. All right, the jama'ah outside the masjid is not like the jama'ah inside the masjid. So inside the masjid. All right, what's the level after that? Good, all right? Which one? Masjid al-Aqsa first. All right, that's level number four. Praying in Salat al-Aqsa uh, al is upgraded how much? 500. 500. Alright, so Salat in Masjid al-Aqsa is worth 500 times more than Salat in any other Masjid. Then a level above that is Masjid al-Nabawi. Now this is rises all, all the way up to 1,000. And then Salat in Masjid al-Haram, 100,000. Alright, so if you can get to level 6, go for it. All right. And if you're there, take advantage of it. You know, there's some people, they go to uh, Hajj or Umrah, and then they're sleeping away in the hotel. It's time for Salah. And you could literally walk there, and they're sleeping away, or they're getting food, or, you know, plan. When you're there, plan around the Salah. Right? If you have to get food, or you have to meet people, plan around the Salah. Don't deprive yourself of 100,000 times worth of, of blessings. All right? Because that's the highest that you can get. So if you're there... You know, try to pray all of the salawat in the in, in Masjid al-Haram as much as you can. Because the salah is, there is equal uh, 100 times more than any other salah in any, any other masjid. Alright, before we get to Ihsan al-Budu also, so we see like uh, that this hadith is emphasizing the importance of the jama'ah. And uh, we know that amongst those who are shaded, the seven shaded under Allah's throne, is رَجُلٌ قَلْبُهُ مُعَلَّقٌ بِالْمَسَاجِدِ Right, the person whose heart is attached to the masjid. And that, of course, will refer to a person who's coming and praying all the time. You, right, your heart cannot be attached to something if you're only coming once in a while, once in a blue moon. So this person who's always constantly coming to the masjid, their heart is attached to the masjid. This is a person who is mentioned in the hadith that they will be shaded under the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a day when there is no shade. Right, we also see uh, in the Quran, Allah talks about uh, prayer in jama'ah even on the battlefield. وَإِذَا كُنْتَ فِيهِمْ فَأَقَمْتَ لَهُمُ الصَّلَاءِ فَلْتَقُمْ طَائِفَةٌ مِّنْهُمْ مَعَكْ وَلِيَأْخُذُ حِذْرُهُمْ أَسْلِحَتَهُمْ Right, Allah talks about uh, when you're in the battlefield and the salah time comes in, you still pray. Not only do you still pray, you still pray in jama'ah. You pray together. And to the point where the, if the army has to split up and one group of the army is guarding, the, the, uh, guarding against the enemy attack, the other is praying with the Prophet there are different ways there's one way mentioned in the Quran in that verse, and then there's several other ways mentioned in the Sunnah, different ways on how to pray Salatul Jama'ah in, in times of fear, distress. It's called Salatul Khawf, and depending on where the enemy is, if they're facing the direction of the Qibla or if they're facing opposite direction of the Qibla, there are different ways to pray this Salah, Salatul Khawf. But, the, but the, the main point is that it's legislated to pray in Jama'ah even on the battlefield, even on the battlefield. Right? So this is uh, highly emphasized. And as we mentioned, some of the scholars have mentioned even that it is rise to the level of being obligatory to pray in the jama'ah. Yes. Which one? Broken down? What do you mean praying at home and then the masjid? Okay. Okay. Oh, praying salah in the masjid? By yourself? In the masjid by yourself? Yeah. Or possibly, but the, but the default is that when you pray in the masjid, you pray in jama'ah. Because right? that's the whole purpose of the masjid, is that people are coming together to pray. And the masjid that doesn't have anybody to pray, then this masjid is, you know, it's not fulfilling its duty of getting people together. So you should, we, every masjid you can expect to have a jama'ah when it's time for the salah. Yeah, so if you miss, this, uh, if you miss the jama'ah, if you had that intention, then you get the reward. As long as you had that intention of coming to the masjid, then you get that reward. 
All right, so that we notice in the hadith that uh, it said, فَأَحْسَنَ uh, الْوُدُوُ This is called إِحْسَانَ uh, or إِسْبَاغُ الْوُدُوُ All right, this was a condition uh, for attaining this reward. And this basically means that a person, when they make wudu, they perform all the obligations and all the recommendations. So if you want to get that extra reward that's mentioned in the hadith, 20 plus times more reward than praying by yourself or in, in, in your shop, then it requires a person to uh, perfect their wudu. And what that means is performing all the obligations of wudu along with the recommendations. All right, so the obligations of wudu, such as making sure you wash your face, wash the hands of the elbows, all right, uh, washing the, uh, wiping the head, uh, washing the feet, right? What is required for the wudu to be valid. And then you also have the recommendations, such as, what are some recommendations in wudu? All right, so the dua before wudu and after wudu. What else? Washing the hands first, okay? Three times, all right? Huh? Yeah, w taking the water in the, in the, in the nose and the mouth. All right, so doing the recommendations along with the obligations, this is what qualifies you to earn the reward mentioned in this hadith. All right, as you said, minimum for congregation is at least two people. If you have two people, then this is a valid congregation. All right, and we talked about the importance of salah and jama'ah, establishing, this is one of the first things Rasul Salaam did when he migrated. All right, one of the very first things he did was establish the masjid, even before actually, even before he got to uh, Medina, he established the masjid in Quba. Right, the very first thing, even before coming to Medina, even before he even settled down, the very first thing he did was establish Masjid al Quba. And as everyone knows, who, when, when you go for Hajj or Umrah and you visit, you, one of the places they visit is Masjid al Quba. So this is the very first thing they did. And then when he went, when he got to Medina, he established Al Masjid al Nabawi. All right. So this shows the importance of the Jama'ah and the, mas the Masjid. We said legislated even in the battlefield. And one of the seven shaded is the one whose heart is attached to the Masjid. Are any questions on this hadith? Before we move on. Okay, now uh, the hadith mentions about um, taking steps, right? Taking steps to the words of the, to the masjid. Uh, so this is also an encouragement to walk, if you can, right? Walking to the masjid is uh, is carries reward, and it also implies that the further you live from the masjid, the more reward you get in coming to the masjid, all right? So the further away you live, the, for, the more distance you have to travel, then the reward is even greater, all right? So the reward for a person who lives right next door is not gonna be like the reward of a person who's coming 10, 15 minutes away. So the longer you're traveling and the longer you have to, uh, to, the distance you have to cover to come to the masjid, then this is more reward for you, all right? Because the Rasulullah says in hadith that every step you take towards the masjid, then a person is upgraded in degree. So the further away you live, that means more steps you're taking. The more steps you take, then one degree of reward for every step you take, one sin is eliminated for every step you take. All right, so the further away you live, so obviously you know, we can use that as an excuse, I live far away, or we can use that as I can get more rewards coming to the masjid now because I live further away. And uh, th there was a tribe in the, in the time of Rasulullah SAW called Banu Salama, and they used to live far away from the masjid. Right, considerable distance, so they used to you know, take some time to get to the masjid, and they, uh, they considered to actually move their, their, their um, dwellings. They wanted to move closer to the masjid. So they told Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi that we want to move closer because we're, you know, we're, we're, we're far away from the masjid. And he told them that, Ya Bani Salama, diyarukum tuktabu atharakum, that your houses, they're, they're, they're writing for you your steps. In, in other words, Every step you're taking, this, that's being recorded. Right? You're, it's being recorded, and that far distance you're covering is being written for you, and you're getting rewards for it. So he advised them that um, it's actually better for you to stay where you are and take the reward. Take the reward that you're getting from coming in that considerable distance. Now, obviously, it doesn't mean that if you have the opportunity to live near the masjid, you should take it because it will be uh, easier and uh, it would uh, be an encouragement to come to the measure more often. So if you have that opportunity, of course, you, you, know, you try to do, do so. Uh, but if you live far away, then uh, you can use this hadith as motivation to come to the masjid because now you are increasing in reward. 
All right, uh, now, how does this hadith re uh, relate to the chapter? So the chapter is on sincerity and intention. Where, where, is, where in the hadith is it indicates that the topic at hand? Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. All right, so that could be implied. We're looking at something specific in the wording of the hadith. Something in the wording of the hadith that talks uh, about this concept of intention and sincerity. Huh? Good. All right. La yuridu illa salah. That part there where it says, um, proceeds to the, to the mosque with the sole intention of performing the salah. All right. So a person is sincere that they're coming only to perform the salah. They're not coming for any other reason. They're not coming for food. They're not coming for uh, hanging out. They're not coming for games. As we said, it doesn't mean that your reward is nullified if you have these intentions. You can't combine these intentions. If you want to come to the masjid and pray and also meet somebody, that's okay. But the one who comes solely, only for performing the salah, his reward obviously is not going to be the same as the one who's coming with mixed intention. All right? Doesn't mean that, as we, we had mentioned before in the previous classes, you can, a person can have mixed attentions. You, you know, you're, 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 you're on your way to a certain place and you stop by the masjid. You didn't really intend to come to the masjid, but you stop by. That's fine. And you'll get rewarded for it. But it's not going to be like the reward for the person who intended just to go to the masjid, left his house, only for that intention, to come to the masjid and, and pray. All right, so that's the uh, reason why Imam Nawi mentions this uh, hadith for that specific part of the hadith. لا يريد إلا الصلاة He does not want anything except for the salah. All right, any questions, Hadith, before we move on? Yes. If you get the reward? I mean, the, the Hadith is general. It's not talking about any specific masjid, but the assumption would be that a person is going to the, the masjid closest to them. That's what would be the assumption. But it, would, it can apply to any masjid. You go to, go to any masjid. Allahu Akbar. All right, moving on. Hadith number 11. Inna Allah katab al-hasanati wa sayyiat thumma bayyana thalik. Faman hamma bi hasanatin falam ya'amalha katabahu Allahu lahu indahu hasanatan kamila. Fa in huwa hamma biha fa'amilaha katabahu Allahu lahu indahu ashra hasanatin ila sabi'i mi'ati du'fin ila adha'afin kathira. Wa man hamma bi sayyiatin falam ya'amalha katabahu Allahu lahu indahu hasanatan kamila. Fa in huwa hamma biha fa'amilaha katabahu Allahu Abdullah ibn Abbas reported that the Messenger of Allah said, uh, this is Hadith Qudsi. So the Messenger of Allah is reporting that Allah Taala said, Verily Allah has ordered that the good and the bad deeds be written down. Then he explained it clearly how to write. He who intends to do a good deed, but he does not do it, but he had that intention. Then Allah records it for him as a full good deed. But if he carries out that intention, he does the action, then Allah, the Exalted, writes it down for him as from 10 to 700 folds. And even more. Uh, but if he attempts to do an evil act and has not done it, then Allah writes it down with him as a full good deed. He does not do it, meaning he stops himself from doing it. Not that he didn't have the opportunity to do it. Right? There's a difference, right? Between a person intended to do an evil deed and he stopped himself from doing it for Allah's sake. This is the one who's rewarded. As, a per, as for a person who intends to do an evil deed and something else came up and stopped him from doing it, then there's no reward for that person. Uh, but then Allah writes it down with him as a full good deed, but if he attends it and has done it, Allah writes it down as one bad deed. All right, so we see that there's a clear difference between how Allah treats good deeds and bad deeds. Clear difference. Uh, this hadith Qudsi, which is that the... What is hadith Qudsi? So the wording is from who? Mm, not quite. The wording is from Allah. And the meaning is from Allah. Right. So the Hadith Qudsi is, Rasulullah is narrating from Allah. So the wording, so Rasulullah is basically saying, Allah said this. So the wording is from Allah, 
Meaning that the Rasulullah is not choosing these words. He's not choosing these words. These are Allah's words. And the meaning is from Allah. Right? It's called Hadith Qudsi. That the wording is from Allah. The Rasulullah is not choosing these words. The wording is from Allah. And the meaning is from Allah. And it's called Hadith Qudsi. Alright? Uh, and the second type of Hadith is what? Called? So you have Hadith Qudsi and then we have Hadith Nabawi. Alright, so what is Hadith Nabawi? So Hadith Qudsi, the wording and meaning is from Allah. What is Hadith Nabawi? The wording is from Rasulullah but the meaning is from Allah. Alright, because anything the Rasulullah says, he's not saying it out of his own desire. وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ As it clearly says in the Qur'an, he does not speak out of his own desire. إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ That is only revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says in hadith as well, أَلَا إِنِّي أُتِيتُ الْقُرْآنَ وَمِثْلُهُ وَمِثْلَهُ مَعْهُ I've been given the Qur'an and something similar to it, referring to the hadith. So everything the Rasulullah says is a type of revelation. Right? Everything he says is a type of revelation. Uh, the only difference is that the, the hadith are his wording, his words, but the meaning is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The meaning is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or approved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that sense. All right? But the hadith Qudsi, the wording is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well as the meaning. All right? So that's the difference. What's the difference between that and Quran? So the Quran, good question. What's the difference between hadith Qudsi and Quran? The Quran has a specific, special definition, which is that the Quran is, uh, number one, is muta'abbad bitilawatihi, meaning that you, you have specific reward just for reciting. Which is that من قرأ حرفا من كتاب الله فله به حسنة والحسنة بعشر أمثالها. Whoever recites a letter from the book of Allah receives a reward, and each reward is equal to ten good deeds. And then he says later on the hadith لا أقول ألف لام حرف ولكن ألف حرف ولام حرف وميم حرف. So each letter of the Quran, it is a special reward just for reciting it, which is ten rewards for each recitation. This is not the case for Hadith Qudsi, right? So the Quran by its nature is uh, you get reward and it is muta'abbad, they say muta'abbad, muta'abbad bi tilawati, meaning that its recitation itself is worship, just by mere recitation. The second distinction is that the Qur'an is a challenge to the disbelievers. It contains a challenge. Alright? Uh, if you are in doubt of what Allah has revealed to his slave, then bring a chapter like it. Alright? This challenge does not exist for Hadith Qudsi. Alright? So the... the there's a challenge in the Qur'an, the challenge is not there for Hadith Qudsi, and the Qur'an has the, uh, the uh, reward, the, the built-in reward of just reciting. Right? But they all, they're, essentially it's coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And, and we can say similar about uh, the previously revealed books as well. So the Torah and the Injil, these are also, the wording and meaning is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the difference between Qur'an and Injil is that one came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and the other came to Isa. Right, but they're all Allah's word and meaning. Yes. Yeah. In, t in terms of the wording is from Allah and the meaning is from Allah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So brother's talking about even when someone would joke. His jokes would be permissible jokes. They said to him once, uh, to Rasulullah you know, you joke with us. And he said, yes, I joke as well, but I only speak the truth. I only speak the truth. So even his normal spe speech would um, be, and if, if he said something uh, incorrect, then it would be corrected later on as well. Well, that's just Rasulullah narrating from Allah. That's why it says, Qala Allah Ta'ala, because Rasulullah is narrating, indicating that this is not my speech, this is Allah's speech. So he, in, any hadith Qudsi would be pre prefaced with that statement. That Qala Allah Ta'ala, or fi ma yarwihi arrabihi tabaraka ta'ala. So it would say, Rasulullah says, narrating from Allah. No, because, I mean, no, 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 no. Yes. Good. So the question is, how do we differentiate between Hadith Qudsi and Qur'an? Uh, Rasulullah would order the Sahaba to write down the Qur'an. So there was, 
So in the beginning, when, yeah. Hadith number, oh yes, yes, yeah. So I thought you were talking about the difference between Hadith Qudsi and Quran. How do we distinguish between Hadith Qudsi and Hadith Nabawi? Yeah, Rasulullah must say at the beginning, either call Allah Ta'ala or call Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, fi ma yarwihi Rasulullah said, narrating from his Lord. So it will say very, very the beginning, clearly the beginning, that this is either Allah saying this or Rasulullah is narrating from Allah. Yeah. And how would you distinguish between the, yeah, uh, between the Hadith Qudsi and Quran? So during the time of Rasulullah uh, at the beginning, they would only write down the Quran. They would not write anything else down. And then later on, that was compiled together. So they, there was always a clear distinction between what is Quran and what is not Quran. All right, and this goes in the topic of compilation of the Quran, how the Quran is complied, uh, compiled together, and that's a, um, a, a, a lengthy topic. We could talk about that, inshallah. All right, we have 10 minutes, so we're going to try to uh, proceed. Uh, so Hadith Nabawi, wording from the Prophet ﷺ, meaning is from Allah. Uh, so writing of the deeds, that Allah uh, says the, the writing of the deeds, and this is, of course, by way of angels. That the angels are the ones who write the deeds. And we have um, several verses in the Quran. إِذْ يَتَلَقَّ الْمُتَلَقِيَانِ عَنِ الْيَمِينِ وَعَنِ الشِّمَانِ قَعِيدٌ مَا يَلْفِذُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ When the two receivers, meaning the recording angels uh, receive, seated on the right and on the left, he, meaning a man, utters no word except that with him is an observer prepared to record. So as we know, right, this is something we all know that there are angels, uh, scribes who are recording everything we do. And Allah says in Surah Al-Mithar, uh, in Fitar, <coughs> that uh, there are kiram and katibin, ya'lamuna ma tafa'un. They, they know what you are, uh, whatever you do. All right, so the hadith also mentions that the range of good deeds is anywhere between 10 and 700. So any good deed you do, the minimum that you get is 10. So one good deed, the minimum you get is 10. And it could go all the way up to 700. Now what distinguishes between 10 and 700? A person's sincerity, all right, and how you perform that action. So you can either get the least amount, this is 10, or you can go all the way up to 700. And even beyond that, as the hadith mentions uh, later on, or even more, right? Ila uh, adha'af kathir, it could go even more than 700. Well, the normal range is 10 to 700. The normal range is, more, uh, is 10 to 700, but it can go beyond that. It can go beyond that, and uh, there are certain actions that don't even fall under this scale, which is, or this one particular action, which is fasting, right? Uh, so, uh, says, Hadith Qudsi, Asamu li wa an ajzi bihi. That fasting is for me, and I will reward it. So, fasting does not uh, fall under this normal range, but the normal range of good deeds is that it is anywhere from 10 to 700. 10 to 700. Uh, so, we see that Allah, when it comes to good deeds, Allah judges. Good deeds by His grace and bounty, right? One good deed, you get ten, all the way up to seven hundred, even more, all right? So, Allah judges good the good deeds by His grace and bounty. As for the evil deeds, the bad deeds, Allah judges it by His justice. One equals one, all right? Well, whoever does an evil, then la yujza illa mithlaha. Then they're not uh, recompensed either, except by equal to it. So when it comes to the evil deeds, Allah treats it under His scales of justice which is that one equals one. Under good deeds, Allah treats it with a different scale, which is by His grace and bounty, one can equal ten, one, one can equal a hundred, one can equal seven hundred, and even beyond that. All right, so this is from the grace and bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that uh, He distinguishes between the good deeds uh, and the bad deeds. <clears throat> now, some bad deeds can be multiplied, as the scholars have mentioned. Uh, certain people, certain times, certain places, if you commit a sin, in a certain place, such as the holy lands, uh, Majid al-Haram, Majid al-Nabawi, all right, uh, in, in the Kaaba, it's not like committing a sin any other place, all right, or certain times in Ramadan, in the last 10 nights. So certain sins com committed at certain times and places can be multiplied, uh, and that will be an exception to the rule, but the general rule is that one sin is equal to one, all right, one equals one for sins, for good deeds, one, minimum of 10, can go all the way to 700, normal scale, and can go even uh, beyond that. All right, uh, we move on to hadith number 12. This is a very long hadith, and for sure, we're not going to be able to cover all of it. Uh, we'll mention a, a portion of it, or we'll at least read the hadith, and the khutbah next week, inshallah, we will make uh, on this topic. Usually, I don't give the topic of the khutbahs beforehand, but we'll make an exception. The khutbah next week will speak about this hadith in, in some more detail. 
uh, we'll just read the hadith and then maybe mention a few benefits and then uh, the time will, uh, then will come. Uh, so Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhum, uh, anhuma, narrates that uh, uh, he heard the Messenger of Allah وسلم, saying, three men amongst those who came before you set out until night came and they reached the cave. So they entered it and a rock fell down from the mountain and blocked the entrance of the cave. So, all right, so they, uh, night came in and they reached the cave and as they, you know, they entered the cave, the rock comes down and it blocks them. And some narrations mentioned that there's rain. Rain caused them to go into that cave. All right, so, so there was some rain and it caused them to seek refuge in the cave. Uh, and so this rock comes and it blocks the entire entrance of the cave so that they can't come out. So they said, nothing will save you from this unless you supplicate to Allah by virtue of a righteous deed that you have done. So there, thereupon one of them said, Oh Allah, I had parents who were old and I used to offer them milk before any of my children or slaves. One day I went far away in searching, in search of grazing and could not come back until they had slept. When I milked as usual and brought this drink, I found them both asleep. So he found his parents both asleep. He came back very late that day. And so by the time he got back home, the parents had already fallen asleep. So he said, I hated to disturb them. And I also disliked to give milk to my children before them. And my children were crying out of hunger at my feet, but I waited with the bowl in my hand for them to wake up, meaning for his parents to wake up. He waited the entire night for his parents to wake up. Uh, and he didn't want to wake them up, and he did not want to give their portion to his children. When they awoke at dawn, they drank the milk. Oh Allah, if I did so to seek your pleasure, then deliver us from the distress caused by the rock. And so the rock moved slightly, but they were unable to escape. So the rock moved, but it did not move enough for them to be able to escape. Right? This is person number one. The second person then offers his dua. The next one said, Oh Allah, I had a cousin whom I love more than anyone else. In another version, it said that a man, as a man can love a woman. I wanted to have intercourse with her, but she refused. Hard pressed in a year of famine, she approached me. I gave her 120 dinars, which uh, in those days were considered a, a, a large amount, a very large amount. Uh, on the condition that she would yield herself to me. She agreed, and when we got together, she said, fear Allah and do not break the seal unlawfully. I moved away from her in spite of the fact that I loved her most passionately. And I let her keep the money I had given her. Oh Allah, if I did that to seek your pleasure, then remove the distress in which we are. The rock moved aside a bit further, but they were still unable to get out. Then the third one got up and he said, Oh Allah, I hired some laborers and paid them their wages, except one of them. So one of them did not take his, uh, uh, the money that was due to him. And he departed. Perhaps he was upset about the, the money he was given. He, he didn't like the, the amount he was being paid. And so he departed without taking his wage, without taking his due. So the man says, I invested his money in business, and the business prospered greatly. And after a long time, this man came back, the man who did not take his wage. He came to me, and he said, O slave of Allah, pay me my dues. I said, all that you see is yours, camels, cattle, goats, and slaves. He said, O slave of Allah, do not mock at me. I assured him that I was not joking, so he took all of the things and went away. Everything he took, he did not leave anything for the man who invested his time and effort to grow this uh, wealth. So he spared nothing. Oh Allah, if I did so seeking your pleasure, then relieve us of our distress. And the rock slipped aside and they got out walking freely. All right, so this is a hadith uh, about, this hadith is known as Hadith al Ghar. Hadith al Ghar, the hadith of the cave. Not to be confused with the story of Ashab al-Kaf, which is mentioned in Surah al-Kaf, the companions of the cave. So you have al-Ghar and al-Kaf, the two synonyms for caves. So this hadith is known as Hadith al-Ghar, the hadith of the cave. The story of the uh, companions of the cave is known as Qiswatu Ashab al-Kaf. Now this, uh, this last thing we'll mention before we close for today, inshallah, this is from the stories of the pre previous nations, specifically from Bani Israel. And the stories of Bani Israel are known, are known as Israeliyat, right? What has been has passed down from the stories and events that happened in the previous nations, specifically Bani Israel. Now, what is the position of Muslims regarding what we call Israeliyat, which are narrations and stories that have come to us from the previous nations, specifically from Bani Israel? Uh, Ibn Kathir mentions uh, at the beginning of the tafsir that we have three positions when it comes to the Israeliyat, or the stories and uh, narrations of the uh, people of the past from Bani Israel. So the first position is that 
whatever com is confirmed by the Sharia or corresponds to it, then we accept it. So this would be an example of what corresponds or confirmed by the Sharia. Right? So this is Rasulullah narrating this hadith, meaning that he affirms that it's a true story and it happened. So these we accept. Right? And then there are narrations from the uh, Israeliyat which clearly oppose the Sharia. Right? Clearly oppose the Sharia. All right, so the Quran mentions or the Sunnah mentions one thing and then you have the Israeliyat mentioning something else. For example, the Quran clearly mentions that Harun salam did not worship the golden calf. All right, he did not worship. All right, the Quran clearly mentions that Harun was, did not take part in mentioning and worshipping the golden calf. The Israeliyat, Israeliyat mentioned that he took part in it. All right, and, they, and they say that he took part in worshipping the golden calf. So what do we say? We say that that's rejected. Because it, it opposes the Sharia, it opposes the Quran and Sunnah, and so it is rejected. And the third is what the Sharia neither affirms nor denies. So there are some narrations that talk about certain things, and we don't find anything in the Quran and Sunnah to affirm it or deny it. So for these uh, types of narrations, it is allowed to narrate them. And this is uh, ex uh, explicit permission from Rasulullah where he says that, Hadithu an Bani Israel wa la haraj. Narrate from Bani Israel, and there's no problem in narrating from them. However, we don't, uh, we, don't, we don't necessarily confirm or deny. And it comes in hadith as well. لا تصدقوا أهل الكتاب ولا تكذبهم Don't believe or don't disbelieve. But say, وَقُلُوا أَمَنَّ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْنَا وَمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكُمْ But say, we believe in what has been revealed to you and what has been revealed to, uh, those, uh, revealed to us. So things that, uh, narrations that come in the, uh, from the Israeliyat and previous uh, nations, that the Sharia neither confirms nor denies, then we can narrate it, but we don't believe or deny it. We don't believe or deny it, but we can narrate it, and, and this is something that Rasulullah allowed. But what we have mentioned here in this story is from the first category, because Rasulullah is narrating it, so he's confirming that this actually uh, happened, and this is a true story. All right, uh, with that, uh, we will uh, conclude today's session, and as I mentioned, inshallah, we'll uh, dedicate a khutbah specifically to this hadith, and. Uh, the many benefits from this hadith, inshallah, uh, in the next uh, Friday's khutbah, inshallah ta'ala. So this brings us to the end of this session, uh, this five-week session on uh, the importance of sincerity and intentions. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us. وَبَنَا تَقَبَلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ وَتُبَعَ عَلَيْنَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَابُ الرَّحِيمُ And we have uh, dinner uh, prepared after salah, inshallah ta'ala. We uh, thank uh, those who prepared the dinner and arranged it and uh, made the effort to uh, provide the dinner for us tonight. And, uh, we, uh, we, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward them uh, and to increase them in, uh, in, in good. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen subhanatullahi wa bihamdik nashiru la ilaha la anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.